Our first speaker is Thomas Taylor Erickson. We are delighted to have him, as we are delighted to have you. Would that it? You know the scheme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Thanks very much. I'm uh, very much forward to seeing the sign that you have to earn, okay? So I'll, uh, okay, I'll do my best. So, but first of all, before I begin, well, thanks very much to, to Rebecca for, for inviting me to Trump's and finally making it and for being such a, a wonderful um, and generous person. Uh, and, uh, and I should also say that this is going to be about diversity. It's about living together in a complex space. And I think I may even say a complex urban space, if that's okay by you. Because Tromsø is not a big city, but it's a very compact and very urban place. It gives you the feeling of arriving at an urban crossroads, where lots of different kinds of people meet. And that's what we think when we think city. And it's been like this since, I mean, since the, the first cities were built. The city was a place where people met who didn't know each other before. And they had to find ways of getting by and getting along. And diversity in Tromsø, in the sense of ethnic and cultural diversity, I mean, there are all other sorts of diversities, which I may mention in a little while. In the sense of ethnic and cultural diversity is also not new as such. I mean, we were reminded of it, I was reminded of it just as I was walking down the main street uh, earlier today, and we were all reminded of it, I guess, a few years ago when controversy erupted around the usage of Sami language on public science, you know, at the university and elsewhere. Uh, where the, the population of Tromsø was divided as to the uh, appropriateness of using Sami language. A, a reminder of a kind of cultural diversity that goes, goes, back in, in, goes way back in history. And I should also say something else. Since Rebecca spoke about herself, I'm also going to say something about myself. Um, and my dad, Ulrich uh, Eriksen, grew up in Göttingen, okay? So, I mean, I've been to Trumpson many times, and I've given many lectures here, but usually at Dalvika, okay, and I'm very pleased for the first time in my life to be able to give a, a talk in the street where my dad grew up. Of course, the house in which he grew up was demolished many years ago, and I don't think anybody misses it. I mean, these were sort of working class, drafty, nasty, um, probably quite unpleasant, to be, by, judging by our, our standards, uh, buildings, but it was his home. Uh, well, where was he from? Yes, he was born in Tromsø, but he was first generation Tromsø, like so many. I mean, in Oslo, they often say that hardly anybody has all their four grandparents from Oslo, which indicates that there's been a lot of mobility, there's been a lot of movement into the city. In recent years, largely from other countries, uh, formerly throughout much of the 19th and 20th century from other parts of Norway. And uh, in, my, in my dad's case, uh, only two, three generations back, they were speaking Sami. It took a long time before this was addressed and before this was made explicit to me as I grew up, because it was not something that he was too keen on talking about. I mean, he didn't deny it as such, if you ask, but it was not considered something you bragged about in the 1970s, which it would have been now, possibly, to a great extent. I don't know, but it's, 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 uh, uh, the point is it's very diverse. And I could take my, uh, the other side of my biography as well also to illustrate that diversity in Norway is not something new. Um, oh yeah, all right, why not? Why not? I mean, my mum, who's from southern Norway, she grew up in Oslo. Very different class background. And I mean, the main encounter between those two uh, people was not so much about boy meets girl, it was about working class from northern Norway meeting middle class from, from Oslo. So, so they, they had some issues, okay? Uh, not amongst themselves, between themselves, but around them. Um, but when she decided in the 1980s, for some odd reason, um, still obscure to me, to get herself a bunad, okay? Uh, a fork dress. As many Norwegian women did in the 1980s. People who had never owned a bunad in their lives, all of a sudden, they discovered the need to get a bunad. This has complex historical causes, it, and it is to do with globalization. And it is to do with a yearning for roots when they are somehow, uh, they, they feel distant, okay? The yearning for roots when you no longer know exactly who you are and where you're going, and when everything seems new. I'm coming to that in a little while. Point is that when she decided to get a boonard, she could choose between four or five different boonards to which she could lay moral claim. Because you have to earn your boonard in all, you have to be from a place where the boonard is from. And if you're not from it, at least a close family member, right? Your family, as it were. But the, but the thing is that in Norway we have a cognatic kinship system, which means that we reckon kin both on the father's side and on the mother's side. And the mother's kin is, we're just as related to the people on my mother's side as we are to the people on my father's side. 
So she could choose. Her mom came from Bergen, okay, they've got a Bühne, which is quite new and it's not very glamorous, but her mother's fox came from Song, okay, which is La Norvège Profonde, okay, it's deep Norway. Right, so she could take Song or Bergen, but she could also opt for Vesthelemark, because that's where Hilla is, you know, the farm Hilla, okay, where my uh, maternal grandfather uh, never lived but was born. He, he gone away as soon as he could, you know. <laughs> Migrated to Canada where my mum was born. So you see, I mean, <laughs> we all have this sort of strange, many of us have this sort of strange analogy. So she could go for West Hellebike, which is glamorous, it's La uh, Norvège Profonde, and it's, but it's very expensive. Uh, <laughs> so she had second thought. Well, she'd lived in Oslo, I mean, she'd grown up in Oslo. And there is an Oslo boom on as well. <laughs> but then she had spent most of her adult life in Tönsberg, okay, where I grew up, in Westfall. So in the end, she bought the best for Bunad. So what does this tell us about roots and identity? Well, that they bifurcate, that roots go in many directions. There, there is a term for this used in some fancy social theory, where the idea of the roots, that we are rooted, botanical metaphors, that people like Salman Rushdie have been rebelling against all his life, that we, are, we human beings are like trees. You know, someone asked Salman Rushdie once, this was before the fatwa, when he was still Controversial for other reasons. He was controversial because he subverted the English identity. You know, he looked Indian, he had an Indian name, he wrote about India, but he mastered the English language better than most English and lived in England and published books there and was a rather popular writer. And he had just come back from Nicaragua, writing a book in Nicaragua, okay? And then he was asked on TV, so Mr. Rushdie, what are your roots? And he then pointed to his feet saying, what do you see at the end of my legs? You know, this was on TV. <laughs> Do you see roots? You know, no, you see feet, or as I would say, boots, you know? Roots are boots, okay? Roots with a double U or root, as in English pronunciation, R-O-U-T-E-S. Roots or roots. Okay, so he didn't have roots, but he had boots on this, at the end of his legs. But the fancy term, which is used in some social theory, is rhizome. The rhizome, rhizomatic uh, way of spreading, as it were, your roots which is <coughs> a certain kind of plant which grows underground and it sprouts up in unexpected places. It doesn't go top down, it, goes, it grows sideways and in rather unpredictable and erratic ways. This is a way of talking about and thinking about who we are and how we are connected to others, <coughs> which gives you a very different view of the world than if you think about human beings as though they were trees. So this was very long, not that long, but Slightly, slightly long introduction to the main topic, but I'm, I'm already talking about the main topic, which is that about who we are. What is the meaning of the word we? How do we delineate it? And how do we allow other people to come into if they want to? And what if they don't? That's another question. Let's not ask that today. To come into that, uh, as it were, the circle of who we are. Um, and there are many recipes for this. There are many ways of allowing people into a society or a community. There are many different kinds of mechanisms of integration in various societies. Most of them urban. Rural societies on the whole, not always, but on the whole, rural societies are rather less skilled at admitting uh, outsiders than urban societies. And certainly this goes for most, but not all peasant societies. So when we talk about diversity, we very often talk about cities very often talk about the urban, which is where people meet, where they come in to do their business, to do their trade, to escape from stigma if they belong to religious or sexual minority. They can go to the city and they can be anonymous and they can find like-minded people. As I tell new students who come to the University of Oslo, and they come from, not so much from abroad, unfortunately, but we're getting there as well, but from other parts of the country, I always tell them that this is a wonderful place to be because at the University of Oslo, Many of them come from small places around Norway, okay, as I did when I came to the University of Oslo. Um, I tell them that this is a wonderful place to be because you'll find people who share your interests, who share your passions. You may find your best friends here if you haven't already. But it's also a place where you can walk around for four or five years because, be, be, without really getting to know anybody and without anyone noticing. You know, that's the flip side of urbanity. It's the alienation side of urbanity, right? So in other words, it is this open space. So in a city, we have to invent <coughs> forms of integration. And this is what they, they've been doing in Alta, which is, I mean, it's an, it's an odd example to, to drag out because Alta is a fairly small place. But it is urban, and it's also very diverse. And we'll hear more about Alta later this evening, about its diversity and its history of diversity. 
Uh, and that is what we try, and what Rebecca and others are trying to do in, in Tromsø, to find this grammar, to find these buttons, to press, uh, and to find the ways in which to create spaces for uh, conviviality, for urban conviviality. I think that's what we, what we could call it. And as I said, many recipes for this, and have many different ways of admitting people into your charm circle. Uh, in certain societies in New Guinea, I mean, being an anthropologist, I have to mention New Guinea, okay? But I'll only mention it this once, and then I'll return to, to Tromsø and to other, to other places. In certain societies in New Guinea, people become kin. They become kinsfolk. They become relatives by eating the same food. Not relatives in the sense of having emerged from the same womb, okay? Or having the same biological father, but relatives in a fairly morally committing way. If you share food with someone, he or she will have to share food with you later on. Or if they don't, they'll have to do you a favor. You know, if you ask them for a service, if you need their help, they have to come to your, come to your assistance. Or if you need someone to confess to, you know, I have difficulty with my girlfriend, you know, I need someone to talk to. Uh, she, she doesn't want to be with me any longer, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Then the person you've shared food with will sit and listen, because it's his or her obligation. This is the glue of society, right? This is what makes us human beings, that we can develop this kind of relationship. Point being that there are many different ways of developing this kind of relationship. And what we're trying to think about this evening is, how can we develop this kind of relationship? Not necessarily someone to confess to, but perhaps that as well, in a place like Tromsø, which is increasingly diversifying. Now, part two and a half, okay? Starting now. Um, something has happened to diversity, and we may say perhaps that diversity in the early 21st century has become more diverse than before. There's been a diversification of diversity. And someone came up with, a few years ago, a new concept which has, in a sort of phenomenally fast way, made its way into much social science literature, namely the term super diversity. In fact, only last week, I mean, I spent all of last week in Berlin at the Academy of Super Diversity. There's a chair, there's a professorship in super diversity now at the University of Birmingham, and they have weekly events around super diversity. Uh, there is not yet a journal of superdiversity, but lots of articles sprinkled around the social science literature now, which use or criticize or discuss the term superdiversity. So what's super about the kind of diversity we have, uh, we have here? Well, Rebecca already mentioned it. You said 112 nationalities in Tromsø, okay? 112 nationalities in Tromsø. I don't know the figure in 1990, but I expect that it would be slightly less. Uh, when the term superdiversity was first introduced, the main example was London. And the guy behind the term, uh, Steve Vertemek, who's a, he's an American, as a, as a name uh, tells you, Vertemek, okay? <laughs> the name tells you he's American, of course he, his grandfather was Slovene, and he got his PhD from Manchester, and, and therefore he works in Germany. And that's written about Trinidad, and that's how I know it, because we both worked in Trinidad around the same time. Now that's sort of the rhizomatic form of identity. And when Steve Vertemek first came up with the concept of superdiversity, he spoke about London. And basically the short argument was this. Until quite recently, in the 20th century, and even in the 19th century, there was substantial migration into London, largely from the colonies, from the empire. And the, the people came in communities, they came in pairs, there was chain migration. Someone from your village had gone, and, and you got a letter from him saying that, look, you can, you can come as well, I'll find your job, and you can stay with me until you find your own flat. Chain migration. The kind of migration that was also typical of Norway in the 1970s and 80s. I mean, where the vast majority of Norwegian Pakistanis come from a small cluster of villages about halfway between Lahore and Islamabad. That's chain migration. Or, or, or the, the Tamil migration into Norway, same pattern. You know, community, caste, village-based migration from particular areas of Sri Lanka. Well, um, so that was the situation in London as well. You knew where the Bangladeshis were. They were in Tower Hamlet. You knew where people from Jamaica were. They were in Brixton, etc. and so on. There were Indians in certain parts of South London, there were Jews in certain parts of North London. You could, you could make an ethnic map, a mosaic, with, with rather sort of large uh, colored spaces for each major ethnic group. Now you know what I'm going to say. This is no longer the case. In the past, people came from a few places and went to a few places. Nowadays, people come from lots of places and they go to lots of places. Uh, and they don't even stay there forever. So when we did research in Oslo on Polish uh, um, construction workers, we asked them the kind of question, 
That's how rude Norwegians would ask Pakistanis in the 1970s, where are you from and when are you are going home? <laughs> but remember, at the time, many Pakistanis thought they were going home. They thought they were just staying for a few years to save money, to get married, buy themselves a house. But then things took another turn and, uh, and they became settled. Um, but the poets, they would say, well, they know where they're from. But to the second part of the question, the answer would be, I don't know, because my contract expires in four months. And if it's not renewed, I have to go somewhere else, maybe back to Poland, maybe to Germany. Or they may say, I hate this country because Norwegians are so difficult to get to know. I mean, they, they leave the office out or they leave the workplace at 3.30 and then you don't see them again until next morning. <laughs> and uh, or, or they, and they, you, they never ask you for a beer, you know, in, in the weekend and that sort of thing. Norwegians are hopeless people. But if my girlfriend gets that Erasmus scholarship enabling her to study anthropology at the University of Oslo, for example, <laughs> a random example, uh, then I'll stay on. Or, they might say, well, yeah, we, my wife and I, we've been there for a few years now. We're not sure if we're going to stay. We started learning language a bit. But if our son starts school here, which he would, you know, next year, then that might, you know, be, that might be a reason for us to stay. So in other words, they're undecided. And you have new forms of migration, tourists who forgot to leave. You know, when the holiday was over. <laughs> I mean, quite a few of those in Britain, okay? Maybe not so many in Tromsø. This is a most transparent society, uh, with a slightly less developed informal sector. Uh, but tourists who forgot to go home, or students who stayed on because they got a girlfriend or a boyfriend, who managed to get them a job, you know, in a, in a basement uh, somewhere, or, or, or as a minicab driver, or, or, or whatever, you know, uh, some kind of temporary job. You have all of these sort of fuzzy categories of people who are simply on the move, as the sociologist and philosopher Zygmunt Bauman famously said when he uh, Slightly exaggerating a bit, you know, saying that, said that, um, the world is now on the move. The point I'm trying to make is that there's been an acceleration in mobility, uh, okay? There's been a diversification of diversity. Uh, and this requires new sets of skills when we're going to maneuver in this territory. And uh, I'm slightly flattered that Rebecca calls me an expert, okay? And I, I may, there may be one or two things I know about diversity. But uh, I don't have the recipe any more than any of you do, because we are now navigating uncharted territory. We're rebuilding the ship at sea. We're trying to devise some new ways of creating a new kind of community, which is a 21st century kind of community, which moves faster, which changes faster, and which requires new sets of skills that we didn't have before. And I think you know some of the skills were the ones that, uh, that you showed us just now, I mean, to do with the ability to listen. But how easy is that in your everyday life? I mean, we go on autopilot most of the time. Otherwise, I mean, to do anything else would have been very exhausting. So maybe we should try to incorporate in that autopilot the skill that is needed to maneuver in, in this kind of uh, complex territory. I mean, for one thing, it may be necessary sometimes to think of a, comp a culturally complex urban society as consisting of communities. It may, be, it may be useful sometimes. For example, there are religious communities, religious congregations, or there are language groups. If there are large language groups, that makes sense. But nowadays, I mean, in a city like London, 300 languages are spoken, but in Tromsø, the number is about 120. Which means that uh, it wouldn't really make sense to require of people who work here in the municipality or in, in the civil service to learn those languages. Well, everybody has, you know, everybody has the right to be communicated with in their own language. It may be doable, but it would have been expensive and very cumbersome. Or if I, as a citizen, as a good citizen, I want to be able to deal with everybody, so I should learn a little bit about Vietnamese culture, about Tamil culture, about Kenyan, or Luo, Kikuyu, and Maasai culture, etc. It wouldn't be feasible. So what I'm, what I'm getting at is that what is required of us now is probably to develop some generalized skills of dealing with super diversity. A generalized super diversity competence. But where are we going to practice that skill? And this is where CISA comes in, and it is where um, Rebecca comes in, and where other initiatives uh, come in. How do we find the space in which to practice these skills? Let me, how am I doing with time? How many? All oh, right, brilliant, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. 
Maybe I'll get my price. We'll see. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I, actually, I don't think so. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, so where are we going to practice? Where does integration typically take place? Ah. Integration. I mean, it's a difficult word. You sometimes get the impression that the only people who can be integrated in this country are immigrants, and the ones who are going to integrate them are Norwegians. We must integrate the immigrants. Does it sound a bit paternalistic? I mean, it reminds me of the way they used to talk about foreign development aid in the past, and some people still do. Uh, but as a result, maybe in a generation or so, the only people who are integrated in this society are going to be immigrants. None of the Norwegians are going to be integrated, because nobody has made an effort to integrate them. So there's something old about the very term integration, which, 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 should, be, which should be interrogated. I mean, we should think critically about how we use it. But where does, say, social participation in society, where does that typically take place? I mean, there are two or three standard arenas. The workplace is one, where you get to meet people. Uh, sometimes people make friends at workplaces, sometimes they don't. And then there are the schools, which are enormously efficient uh, machines or mechanisms of social integration in, the, in this society. Participation in schools and everything that happens around the schools. Anything from flea markets to uh, children's birthday parties, uh, the organization of excursions, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's why I'm saying that when this Polish couple, when their son or daughter starts school, they may realize that, uh, you know, they may say to themselves, bloody hell, we've moved, you know, we live here now, possibly. Uh, we have some material which indicates that this, this is the threshold. This is the sort of the tipping point for many undecided couples. Uh, they decide to stay when their children start school because then they start to get invited to birthday parties. They go to parental meetings. They may even drink coffee with some of the other parents. You know, that's one of those arenas where this kind of thing is possible. And talk about the weather uh, and, and, and say nasty things about the teachers. Which is, and there's nothing like a good enemy, you know, to create a sense of community. So to have some bad teachers is always a good idea if you want to create solidarity among, uh, among parents. Right? It's one of the best things to do. Uh, anyway, so you have the schools, you have the workplace, but what about all the other areas? And what about those who don't have um, children in schools? Many of the migrants that we are thinking about here would have arrived here not through chain migration, not as families, but as single individuals. Uh, right? Often professionals. And what about those? And what about everybody else? But that, that's, let's focus on those for now. What are the arenas where they might conceivably be able to meet other people and participate in this sort of conviviality? There is some interesting research which is going on right now, which is directed by this guy, Steve Erterbeck, okay? On, uh, it's a project called Global Diversities. Diversities with a C, right? Diverse cities. Global Diverse Cities where the research team is looking at super complex places. Uh, they have found a suburb in Queens, New York, okay, called Astoria, uh, a part of Johannesburg called Hillbro, uh, and, uh, and a part of uh, Singapore called Jerome West. Uh, and all of these are super diverse with many migrants, people, lots of people are not born there, uh, and not necessarily with ethnic, as it were, communities. To some extent they're ethnic communities, but lots of those people who live there are just individuals, they're just people. Um, who have difficulties, they struggle, they don't know how to fill in the right forms to apply for whatever it is they need to apply for. They don't even know how to pay the parking tickets. But in most cases it's not really a problem because they don't have a car yet. Um, so you have these, all of these questions. How do these people manage to create a sense of community? If a sense of community, as it is increasingly nowadays, is a scarce resource. It's not something that comes without saying. It has to be created. Community has to be created. Um, what have they found out, looking at these three cities and how people get by, get along, etc.? I mean, my, my first impression, I haven't read all the research, and it's still in the making. They haven't published that much, but the book came out just last week on global diversity, uh, based on, on work in these three cities, is that people I don't know how to put this. They meet in restaurants, they meet in parks, they meet in libraries like this. This is a wonderful place, by the way. This is a great meeting place. There should be weekly events there, you know? Um, whereas, well, some old geezer says a few things, but that's just a pretext for having coffee and chatting afterwards. Because you need to have some old geezer saying something first, right? You can't just go and have coffee. I think it's important to have a content. 
uh, an event um, as a pretext for doing what you really meant to do, namely informal socializing. One doesn't just go somewhere to socialize informally. One goes somewhere for, for a purpose, to listen to a talk, to listen to a concert, to watch a film, and then you socialize. It's important to keep those spaces. I mean, we go to conferences all the time, don't we? Some of us, well, you and I do, Kurt, anyway. We go to conferences all the time. And the main, there are two main complaints at conferences. One is that there is not enough time for discussion. The other being that the breaks are too short. Because when you finally get started on something interesting, you have to go in and listen to some horribly boring paper. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm just exaggerating, uh, just exaggerating a bit. But anyway, public spaces like parks, libraries, uh, restaurants, etc., they haven't discovered anything revolutionary. What this research confirms for me on global diversity is that creating community has to be done in a local way. Yeah, okay. It has to be based on resources which are available locally. There's no fixed recipe, and it's hard work, you see, it's hard work. When we don't live in these close rural or small town communities where families have known each other since time immemorial, and which, by the way, are incredibly boring places to be for a long time, charming to visit, but who would want to live there? Uh, think about early, early modern Norwegian literature. Nearly all of these early modern novels were about uh, people who escaped from what Karl Marx called rural idiocy. Not my words, okay, but Marx said so. Who escaped from, uh, from, the, uh, from the tragedy and the uh, tedium and the monotony of rural life. I mean, keep this in mind. I mean, let's uh, celebrate the positive qualities of living in the city. Because you have all these possibilities of exposing yourself to new ideas, of being anonymous when you want to, and to socialize with the people you want to be with. The question again is, where do we go to socialize with these people? And what do Norwegians do when they leave work? What on earth do they do? I mean, a friend of mine who's English, he said, you know, he just got out for a coffee at about 3.30. And when they came back, everybody was gone. <laughs> and what on earth do they do? Well, I think uh, one short answer is that this is a very family-oriented society. I mean, so if you, if you don't have a, your own nuclear family, you have to find other things to do. It's a very family-oriented society. And the boundary between private and public is very sharp in Norway, unlike a country like Italy or Spain. Largely for climatic reasons, I think. I, th I don't think there's anything wrong with Norwegians as such. It's just that most of the year, um, you stay indoors most, much of the time. But then, a second part of the question, uh, of the answer is, I'll be quick now. I mean, just a few things about, about, about Norway, about what, what you can do in a place like Tromsø. Uh, when we've been carrying out research on second generation migrants, or first generation Norwegians, depending on how you want to put it, in eastern Oslo, <coughs> it has happened that adolescents have come up to us and they've asked us, you know, they've said, there's something the Norwegians want us to do in order to get integrated, but they never tell us what it is. But it's quite clear, you know, that there is something they want us to do. And depending on who it is, I might say to these people, I mean, you bloody fool, haven't you, haven't you got it? I mean, you've lived there all your life. You have to go out in nature. I mean, put on your skis in winter and your hiking boots in summer, and the Norwegians are going to love you. <laughs> That's one of the things Norwegians do. I mean, seriously. It's what, I mean, in every country, people do different things. Uh, and in Norway, one of the things people do is going out in nature. Uh, so that's one, yeah, 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 that's one thing. What I'm trying to say is that there, are, there can be different kinds of arenas. This library is a wonderful space. There could be events there, you know, and, and with some informal socializing afterwards, with tapas and wine and some cheese maybe on the, on the ground floor. Uh, I wouldn't mind that. Um, <laughs> films, films from around the world. Films introduced by people from other countries, from their country, that sort of thing. You have something along those lines in Trumpson, but it only happens once a year, on a, more reg yeah, on a more regular basis. The final thing I wanted to say, and probably the most serious, my, probably my most serious message is, yes, uh, there are many arenas, there are many ways of doing this. Going out in nature, playing football, taking part in children's activities, Joining up for some voluntary work, as I did on fieldwork in Australia, because I didn't know anybody. So I started to pick rubbish on beaches, and got to know a few people there, you know. Uh, very simple. And they, and they introduced me to their friends. And uh, the climate being what it is in Australia, we could go out on the beach and have a beer afterwards. Um, uh, but there are many different things one can do. Children's sports, etc., uh, music, whatever, whatever one's interests are. But at the end of the day, the bottom line is that resources have to be put into this. The municipality has to show its commitment to creating a community. And it's not free. It doesn't have to be very expensive, but it's not, it's not free. And secondly, the most important thing is 
that Norway, what is Norway nowadays, this super diverse place with so many people from so many places, I think Norway is largely a language community. You know, I think that's, I mean, that's my experience of traveling around the world. Not in the sense that you have to know the language perfectly, but all these little snippets of information, all this buzz, if one doesn't know the language after years in a country, you'll never feel at home there. I think so. I mean, uh, it's not a matter of relinquishing your own languages or language, but it's a matter of just getting the gossip, getting those little snippets of information, getting what the, the argument is about in Nordis and the TV news and the football results and the weather forecast. I think that's, that's probably one, that's one big key to uh, feeling at ease in a different, in a new society. On that note, I thank you for your attention. And uh, now let's see. <laughs> yeah! Excellent. You know, there's a great Norwegian word I'll teach you if you don't speak Norwegian yet, and it is fantastisk, <laughs> which is a nice combination between English and Norwegian, right? I mean, I think that, thank you very much, Thomas. You were, that was fantastisk. <laughs>